The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. We begin with a great story about Harav Yaakov Galinsky. If you haven't yet read his biography, you should read it. It's so uplifting and so amazing. But here is one story that he writes. Harav Yaakov Galinsky, as we know, was a yeshiva bacher when World War II broke out. And him and a whole bunch of boys were eventually deported, convicted, and sent to Siberia, where they underwent terribly grueling and difficult circumstances, but survived, and didn't just survive, thrived, at least from a spiritual perspective, with their amuna intact, as we'll see in this very story. Rav Yaakov writes that in the harsh conditions, the freezing sub-zero temperature, they were required to be outside day in and day out, sawing these massive trees. He said some of the trees were thousands of years old, and he even said one time it was amazing to saw a tree that probably was around in the days of the Tanoim, of the Mishnah, of the Gemara. Regardless of what, a whole week long, that's what they had to do. And then on Shabbos, the requirement was to take um, all these, the wood that had been, you know, eventually sawed down and then chopped up and transported and put it into wagons. And with the Bachram, with the yeshiva students from the yeshivas in Siberia, were a whole bunch of political prisoners who were very high-ranking Lithuanian government officials before the war. There was the, the Minister of Finance, and there was the Minister of Education, and the Minister of Interior. There was all these people. But in prison, they were all lumped together as one group. That's just how it was. And Rabbi Yaakov writes that it was fascinating to see the difference, what happened each Shabbos between the prisoners and between you know, the, the Lithuanian prisoners and between the Yeshiva Bacham. What the Yeshiva Bacham did was they formed a long line which stretched all the way from the pile of wood to the wagons and they passed one you know, block of wood after next, after next, quickly, 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 top speed, top speed. While the Lithuanians, each person on his own, went and picked up a block of wood and brought it to the, brought it to the, uh, to the, carriage, the carriages or the, or the wagons or whatever they had that had to be transported. And the boys, were, the Yeshiva Bacham, quick, 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 they were sweating and they were groaning under the strain of the work. It was, and then they turned to the, you know, the, the Lithuanians turned to the Yeshiva Bacham the first week and they said to them, what exactly are you doing? What are you do? Why are you doing it this way? Why are you putting so much effort and zest? So Yaakov Galinsky loudly said in front of the, you know, the uh, Russian NKVD officer who was overseeing them, and he said to them, he's like, because on Sundays they give us off and that's a waste. One day, Sundays we could be working for Mother Russia, so we decided to work twice as hard today so that we could really you know, make up for that one day off that we have. And the, the Russian supervisor was so impressed. He goes, wow, what's dedication? And Rabbi Yaakov, Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky says, and because of that, I'm sure that the supervisor is going to allot each and every one of us an extra portion of bread each Saturday as we make up for the time on Sunday, because on Sunday, you know, we're really working for Sunday. And the officer thought to himself, and he goes, that's a valid request. I'm going to give each and every one of you prisoners an extra roll each Shabbos. And so each of the Yeshiva Bachim had Lecha Mishnah every single Shabbos. This is just one perspective, one way that they tried to keep Shabbos to the best of their ability, as we'll see soon. In their block, where they all slept in the barracks, um, were, as we said, all these high-ranking Lithuanian officials. Now, it was so cold outside that besides for the coat and everything, you wore every single piece of your clothing that you could possibly wear. If you somehow came to the camps and you had three, four pairs of pants, you wore all those three, four pairs of pants. Even with that, the cold went right through. Anyways, it happened one morning that they awake to cries and shrieks and screams. It seems like, sadly, the pants of the Minister of Education had been stolen. Someone had stolen them during the night and just left him with the one pair. That means the one pair he was wearing at night, they would peel off the many different pairs of pants and just sleep in one. And he woke up. He, this is crazy. It's almost a death sentence. He only has one pair of pants. He doesn't know what to do. And he developed a certain kinship and a friendship with Rabbi Yaakov. And he came over to Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky and he says to him, listen, you're a smart Jew. Everyone knows that here. You got to help me solve this mystery. Who's the thief? Let's play Clue. And Rabbi Yaakov says that he started thinking to himself, and he said, you know what? We, we, uh, there's nowhere to hide anything here. Everything is open. So whoever stole the pants had to somehow find a place to unload them. Who would need pants? And then Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky said, the only real place to unload them maybe is in the, in the kitchen. So one day he walks into the kitchen, and he walks over to the chef, and he goes, whatever happened to all those pants? And the chef like blanches, and he says, you know about it? He goes, how do you know? He goes, oh, he, the guy told me. 
goes, oh, he says, look, come, I'll show you. And he shows him that he had taken the pairs of pants and he cut them into oven mitts. And that's what he was using to transport these boiling hot pots. He didn't have anything. They didn't give him anything to do it. Oh, Rabbi Yaakov says, what did, he, what did he get, by the way? What did the guy get, the thief get in response? Or, you know, what did he get for giving it to you? What did you pay him? He goes, ah. He goes, in the bottom of the pots, of the big soup pots that we have, is a thick part of the soup where there's the vegetables and there's the meat. A lot of the prisoners just get bowls of soup, which is just soup. But if you're lucky and you get from the bottom, it gives you nutrition, it gives you strength. He says, well, that's what I traded it for. I bartered it. He gave me these five, four or five pairs of pants and I told him for the next month or so, I'm going to make sure he always gets the last bowl in the soup the one that has all the vegetables and the hearty chunks of whatever is in there. Oh, wow. Now Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, I'm sorry, Rav Yaakov Galitsky, um, realized um, that what had happened, and now it was very easy for him to catch the thief. He waited the next day by, by dinner, and he watched as prisoner by prisoner came, and he saw that there was one fellow that the, the chef, the guy in the kitchen, made sure that he went on the bottom and he came the thickest part of the soup. And then he realized he had the thief. Miracle of miracle, wonder of wonders. The thief was none other than the minister of justice himself. He didn't say anything to him. He goes back to the minister of education. He says, I got your thief. He goes, how'd you figure it out? He told him, he goes, wow, that's brilliant. That's amazing. That's remarkable. That's crazy. How'd you figure that out? He says, who's the thief? He says, it's the minister of justice. He goes, the minister of justice, the man that's supposed to be the most moral and honest person from everybody? He's the one that stole it. He goes, yes, I'm sorry, I don't have any other way to explain it, but he's the one that stole it. So what should we do? So Rav Yaakov Galinsky says, confront him and tell him that you want to take him to court. He says, what court? He goes, tell him I'll be the judge. Okay, listen, he's the one that discovered it. So the minister of education said to him, no problem. And he went over to the minister of justice and he accused him and he says, you're, you took my pants, I know. And the Minister of Justice broke down. He said, I did. He goes, why'd you do it? He says, listen, I needed the food. What am I supposed to do? He says, but you're the Minister of Justice. He goes, I know, but I needed the food. He says, you know what? We have to go to court. He goes, who's the court? He says, let's go to Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky. Whatever he decides, we have to follow. And the fellow says, you're right. Let's go to the Minister of Justice and to Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky and let's, let's see what we should do. They go to Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky. Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky hears both sides. He pretends he didn't know anything about it. And he says, you know what? I think the only fair thing to do here is that the, at least, the least you can do is to give to the minister of education the soup that you took illegally. If it's his pants that got the soup, well, at least he should get the soup. And the fellow agreed. And both sides walked away. I'm not going to say satisfied, but they felt that justice had been served. Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky writes that this was a tremendously traumatic episode in his life. He just couldn't understand how the minister of justice could be the one thief in the group. So he went over to him and he confronted him. And he said to him, I don't get something. I want to ask you a question. What was your job in Lithuania? He says, I was one of these, you know, the highest level judges. And I was responsible to make sure that there was a system of justice in the entire country. He says, let me ask you a question. If a thief came along and he stole something, what would happen? He says, he'd be punished by the full brunt of the law. He says, how about if the thief claimed that he did it because he was hungry? What would happen? He goes, there's no excuse. You could never steal. So Rabbi Yaakov Kam- Galinsky says to him, listen to what you're, listen, do your ears hear what you're saying? You're saying that for 20, 30 years, you were responsible for enforcing the law in the country. And if somebody stole and someone took something they weren't supposed to take, you would punish them with the full force of the law. Yet you yourself are a hypocrite. So the minister of justice laughs and he goes, do doctors not get sick? Do shoemakers not get holes in their shoes? So ministers of justice could sometimes be not so just. He says, we're allowed to say one thing and do something else. We can talk the talk, but we don't have to walk the walk. And Ryak Kalinsky writes that he was blown away by this. What a hypocrite, what a two-faced person. And as he's walking away, all of a sudden, it hit him like a pound of bricks, the pshat, in a pasuk in this week's parsha, which, by the way, is unbelievable. He's in Gates Almavis. He's in literally the throes of death. And he's relating life to Pesukim and Chalish. But anyways, he brought a pasuk in this week's parsha and parsha Sachremas. The pasuk says like this, Ushmartem es You should safeguard, you should observe my chukim, my statutes, my mishpatim, my laws, asher yasa oisam ha'adam, 
that a person will perform them, v'chai bohem, and they will live with them, live through them, ani Hashem, I am Hashem. And Yaakov Galinsky says he'd heard, he'd seen this Pasuk so many times, but he never chapped, he never fully understood and fathomed what the Pasuk was saying, and this is how he understood the Pasuk. He says, We have to make sure that the chukim, the statutes, and the ordinances of the Rabbi Shalom are observed. But Asher Yasa Oisam, the way that we show, that we safeguard them, is that we ourselves do that. Then Vachai Bohem, that shows that a person has a life with the Rabbi Nishalalim. Ani Hashem says Hashem, I could identify with such a person. You know, I don't know what Chaim, what a life of Tyra is. A life of Tyra is that a person does, he doesn't just say, he doesn't just think, he doesn't just feel, he actually acts. And Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky continued the conversation with the Minister of Justice. And he says to him, now I'd like to ask you a few things. He says, have you ever noticed that on Shabbos we form this crazy line and we go really quickly? Well, yeah, the guy says, why do you do that? No one understands. He goes, there's two reasons. Reason number one is because we don't want to be Michal Shabbos. And if everyone just passes it to the fellow in front of them and we don't carry it the full amount, we're not carrying in Rosh Hashanah four Amis. That's what we're doing. And we're also somehow, we're able to create and craft Lacha Mishnah, two portions. And Rabbi Yaakov continues and says, have you ever noticed that when everyone eats that soup which gives them Kayach, we don't eat it even though we're dying for it, we're barely surviving? Why? Because we keep Halacha. And we didn't just talk about Halacha and keep it and observe it when it was convenient. V'chai bohem. It's part of our life, but more than them. Asher yasay sam v'chai bohem. Doing them is life. And not doing them is tantamount to death. Chas v'shalom. Do you know that our tradition, we believe, according to, to, to the Torah and according to our Messiah, that when a person dies before they are buried, then they're able to hear everything that's going on in the world and they're able to understand everything around them. It's only once we put them under the ground that that ability ceases. So if so, let me ask you a question. What, when you go to a funeral and the coffin is standing there and people are all around it, what's the difference between the person that's lying there horizontally and everyone that's vertical? Everyone can hear, everyone can understand, everyone can fathom, probably everyone could feel. The answer is very simple. The people that are vertical can do, they're alive. The person that doesn't do, they're dead. That's the Pasuk. Asher yasa oisam v'chai bohem. You want to know what the definition and the difference between life and death is? Asher yasa oisam. It's the ability to perform. And I think that this gives us great pause. And it gives us an obligation almost to take a moment and think how much of our mitzvah observance and our performance is just rote. It's just the society. It's just the way that we were raised. What happens when we travel? When we're not in our comfort zone? When we're away on vacation, do we all of a sudden relax? And no one knows if I really dive in, if I'm going to go to a minion, if my standards of kashras or tznias are going to slip. That's how we know. That's the definition. If v'chai bahem, if a person is living a life of tyrant, it's asher yathabam. When a person's observance of chukim, of mishpatam, of their belshams mitzvahs is rock solid, no matter where they find themselves. It's something we have to think about. How much of our mitzvah observance, how much of our lives do we really own? And the litmus test is when things aren't the way they usually are. When there's challenges, when there's struggles, when we're not in our comfort zone, what happens all of a sudden? That's a very solid question that we need to ask ourselves. And I think that the mesira snefesh factor, the dedication and the fact that we're willing to go to the furthest degree to observe mitzvahs is the indicator if a person is asher yathleisam v'chai bahem or not. And that's why we see throughout the history of Klal Yisrael tremendous Mesiris Nefesh, tremendous dedication to the mitzvahs, and that is life itself. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to inspire.org.